Good morning again. So we call that the public reading of Scripture. We cover some ground to hear God's Word read. And now we're going to work together to try and understand. So let's pray and ask God to be with us in this moment. Father, we confess our need of you. We turn to you. We would like to know you more today. You have told us stories of your glory and your work. And I pray that the history of your work among your people would affect our trust in you, our understanding of you, our lives lived for you now. May they not be empty, old, worn out, tired stories. May they come alive because your spirit presses them upon our hearts today. This request I make to you, in Jesus' name. Well, good morning, church. We today set our attention on Acts chapter 25 first part of it anyway, and what you'll find here, as you just heard read, is an orderly account of the affairs of Paul as they continue to unfold, particularly as it relates to accusations that were brought forth and against him by the Jews, and uh, if you'll recall, he was arrested in Jerusalem, they were making accusations about him being against the law and the temple and this place and all these things, uh, so much has happened since that time. As far as him being mobbed, him being examined, everybody wondering what's going on. And Paul now finds himself still in custody and still pending what's going to happen with my situation. And so there's the affairs of Paul's life and case that are going to be examined today in Acts chapter 25. So you're being brought in to hear the detail, in, in pretty great detail, the circumstances of one man in one particular instance, one particular follower of Christ. And, and for some reason, we have to grapple with the reality that God wants you and me to know this. He wants us to understand and remember. He recorded it for us and for all of time as inspired words from his lips. And so we have to consider that reality that, that God wants us to know the details of Paul's affairs. And I wonder some about why. Why is it that God wants us to see what's going on here? And I believe that it's not just to know that these things happen, but it's also to know how they happen. And the way that they unfold help us understand a few things. So I want to give you a few thoughts on, on why this may be. I think, first of all, as we see why they're unfolded in such great detail, detail it's because, one, it's historical. This is being fitted accurately within the record of history. The rulers, the times, the places, and that is important for us because it is part of the historical record that should give us some confidence of the reality of this story. But not only is it historical, it's official. This now is, is like the proceedings of, of, of a legal battle that's about to unfold. If, if two weeks ago when I preached we were talking about sort of a mission impossible feel, like we're reading Acts, we're going, man, there's like this spy and this kid, and he unfolds the plot, and the plot has a counterplot and all that. If that's what was going on two weeks ago, well, then today's like an episode of Law and Order, or whichever show you're into where you get into the courtroom and you see the, the defense and the prosecution and, and the officialdom unfold. That's what's going on in these pages of Acts. So it's historical, it's official, but, but we also need to take note as we walk through this together. That's personal. You see, this is Paul's life here. This is his freedom, or lack thereof. This is the real details of his very life, and we need to not miss that, because it's recorded for us. We are to put ourselves in his shoes and try to consider what must this have been like for this follower of Jesus. And yet, not only is it historical, official, and personal, through all of this and all these moving pieces, ultimately, what I hope to demonstrate before you today is that it's planful. That is, that there's more going on than just uh, the justices and the, the powers that be and Paul and all these players. There's more going on. It's planful. There is a divine design. 
in a divine involvement at every level of this moment. So here's the driving thought that I hope to leave you stewing on today. If you miss everything else, I want to have you leaving thinking about this thought. When we consider the, the conducting of our affairs, we do well to remember that from him and through him and to him are all things. When we consider the conducting of our affairs, and I, I say that in a certain way, Who's conducting the affairs is one of our questions today. The, the generalized, the conducting of our affairs. But when we consider the realities of our life, the things that are playing out, all the powers that may have a part in that, listen, friends, we will do well to remember the biblical truth that from him, that is Jesus, and through him and to him are all things. So I hope to show that not only is this just a historical and an official passage or one that's personal to Paul, but it is a planful moment. We're going to just walk through the progression of these events. I kind of want to take a note of, of a few of the particulars as we go, but I want to also and especially be constantly asking ourselves the question, who is conducting these affairs? So we're going to follow these events starting in verse 27 of chapter 24. That's just to kind of catch us up to speed of what's going on. So turn with your Bibles. If you have them, I hope they're open. If you don't, the Bible in front of you, we really mean it. Use it. And if you don't have it at home, like, please take it home. This is the word of God. Acts chapter 24, verse 27. We catch up to the story when it says, When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. So keep this in mind. The timeline here. Two years have elapsed. What happens when time elapses? It's where you take a whole lot of stuff and you condense it into one quick little thing. It's what you can do with your iPhones these days. You can make time elapse. Two years of Paul's life condensed into this sentence. And things have changed. When we last left Paul, Felix had just spent time trying him. And he had said, if you look up in 24 verse 22... He had said that when Lysias, the tribune, comes down, I will decide your case. He said, as soon as that guy shows up, we'll get this thing buttoned up and I'll make a decision. Is that what happened? Well, if you were here with us last week, no, it is not what happened. Instead, he came with his wife, they were interested in his story, and he spoke about the things of Jesus. He was able to explain self-control, righteousness, the realities of a follower of Christ, and they just used it as sort of a curiosity they used it as a chance perhaps to get a little something in the pocket. And instead of coming through with, I will decide your case, he leaves Paul. Leaves him in prison. And we also find that there's a certain motive to that. He said he wanted to do the Jews a favor. That's not the only time you're going to hear that in this text. What's that about? Well, he's trying not just to understand truth. He's not just trying to understand the results of the case. He's got other motives going on where he's trying to manage a situation. You see, Felix, the previous one, he was the procurator. He was the sort of one in charge of Judea for about seven years, from 52 to 59, they say. And now Felix is being succeeded. There's a transition of power. This is that, this is that handoff. This is that moment when, when the changing of the guard takes place from one leader to another leader. And now Festus is taking over for Felix, and it's been two years Imagine Paul in two years. Why isn't this moving along? Why the pace? Can we hurry things up? And that feeling of two years just sort of disappearing. I don't know about you. I actually can relate to that period of time. In a way, it feels like two years just disappeared because we had COVID take place and what in the world happened and all kinds of things got held up. And there's a lot of why questions asked in the midst, at least for me. Paul spent two years just left perhaps even feeling forgotten. But now Festus comes on the scene and, and he needs to kind of get a feel for what's going on in his new realm of power. So what does Festus do? He visits Jerusalem. He's got to get to know his territory. He's got to get to know his area of responsibility. And so from Caesarea, where his headquarters would be, he goes down to Jerusalem. He's kind of an obligatory new manager on the scene. Let's check out the different areas of, of my power. And he goes to Jerusalem. And at that time... As we focus in on this first section of what's going on, basically what happens, we're going to use a lot of legal terms here, right? Because that's what's in the text. And basically, Paul is re-indicted. 
he, he gets accused once again by the Jews. They bring back out his case, bringing the charge, the indictment. Now I look this up in case you forget your legal terms. An indictment is a formal charge or accusation of a serious crime. This is Paul being accused of things for which they want him to be killed. And so there's a decision about where he's going to be um, heard, where he's going to be arraigned. That's another legal term that kind of applies here. Arraignment is the, the call uh, to bring someone before a court to answer for their criminal charge. So as you look in the first few verses of chapter 25, all this is unfolding, and they say, here's Paul, and here's what we have against him. And they, they bring these many and serious charges, verse 7. And Paul says, Neither against the law or the Jews, uh, of the Jews or against the temple nor against Caesar, I committed any offense. But Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Do you wish to go up to Jerusalem? They're trying to figure out where are you going to be heard? Where are we going to get the proper case? And in Jerusalem is where the Jews would prefer to have it. Why is that? If you notice in the text, they wanted him to be brought down in front of Caesarea to Jerusalem because they were hoping to re reenact a, a little failed plot from before. If we can get him moving from point A to point B, we can sit in ambush and take his life before that time. Found an old trick, but it didn't work before. We try it again. And yet somehow it doesn't play out that way. It plays out instead that this is going to happen in Caesarea, not in Jerusalem. So you kind of see just generally what's going on. The text was read to you. I know that I'm not going word for word through the text. We're just walking through these events. There's a couple of things to notice that I just think are worth noticing. And again, we're driving towards a point of who's really conducting the affairs here. First of all, we notice the timing. What's your pace like? Is two years of waiting slow or fast? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 reminds us that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. God has a time. And Paul is within that time limit. So there's a, there's a timing issue about how long this is taking. There's also this change of leadership. And, and it reminds us that you, you might be saying as we ask the question, who's conducting the affairs of Paul here? Paul, in this part, the first section, has very little to say for himself. It's mostly other people making decisions that affect his life. The Jews would have their say, they would like to have a say over what happens to Paul's affairs, and yet the Roman authorities are higher than the Jewish ones, and they get overridden. Who's in charge here? And as we think about this change of leadership and who's in charge, we need to remember the biblical truth. Jesus said it in John chapter 19, verse 11, as he was under someone conducting, in a sense, his affairs, and he said to Pilate, you would have no authority over me, if at all unless it had been given to you from above. Romans 13 supports that same thought as Paul says, there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. <coughs> so while Festus may think he's entering into his realm of responsibility, he's not as in charge as he may think. And while the Jews think that they have a voice of influence, they may not be as in charge as they think. There is more power going on than meets the eye. The same truth comes out of Daniel chapter 2, when Daniel blesses the Lord God of heaven, and he says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. So we ask the question, who's conducting these affairs? Yes, at a societal level, and the cogs of justice are trying to move, though slowly, there is power unseen yet. So that's the first scene while they basically have the, the moment of his indictments and the decision of where he will be going. But it moves on from there. Look down to verse 6. I already read a little bit ahead. Pardon me for getting ahead of myself. But here in verse 6, Festus stays about 8 to 10 days, a week and a half or so, hanging in Jerusalem, conducting the rest of his affairs. And then finally he goes down to Caesarea. He had invited the Jews to come with him. He's like, look, this is going to happen soon. You guys might as well come with me, and there we will have the arraignment, and we'll continue this case. And that's when he arrives. The Jews come down from Jerusalem, and when everybody's there, he takes his place. He takes his place of decision. And it says that he, he, he took the, uh, his seat on the tribunal, and ordered Paul to be brought. It's time. It's time for what I believe we can call the preliminary hearing. 
You may think this is the actual case, but in a moment here, you'll see that they're not really try, doing the full trial. They're actually trying to figure out, is there enough evidence to work with here? In our American justice system, we have uh, something called a grand jury. And the grand jury is actually a group of people brought together to hear the beginnings of the details and decide, is there enough evidence to make a charge and to proceed forward with the case? It feels a little bit like that here. Or like a preliminary hearing where we're going to bring together the prosecutor in the preliminary hearing has to be convincing enough that we've got enough here for a real case. Now, I had to like spend some time on the Department of Justice website to get my vocabulary right. So forgive me, law students or lawyers in the room, if I've got it a little bit out of order. But I think that's basically how it goes. And it just helps me to get a feel for what exactly is unfolding here. Because look what happens. They're going to hear some details. The Jews bring their charges. It says that there's many charges, lots of accusations flying, and they're serious charges. And that also the text notes that there are things that couldn't be proven. Baseless allegations just throwing darts. And that's where Paul, the part I got ahead and read, that's where Paul has his chance to speak. And he basically pleads not guilty. I didn't do anything to offend the law of the Jews. I didn't do anything to offend or, or to defile the temple, as they say. And he's basically saying, ask the witnesses. How did they find me when I was there? They didn't find me riling up the crowd. They didn't find me with a Gentile in the inner courts. None of those things are true. Nor, and note this, he's not just defending himself against the Jewish aspects of this case. He's also saying, I haven't even offended the laws of Caesar. I wasn't doing anything for which somebody can bring an accusation. And so... Festus, here it is again, wishing to do the Jews a favor. Now, I just want to comment on that because you want to understand why is, why is this sense of justice being marred by favors? Don't you get the idea that if there's a favor involved, then already we're playing favorites? How do you feel about the justice of that case when already there's favor being given one side over the other? And what's happening here is Rome is trying to rule an empire but they don't have enough troops to be everywhere at all times. And so what they do is they work with localized leaders in various places that they've conquered, and they win over the leaders with favors, so that the leaders then in turn are, are favorable towards Rome, and then they will help keep the peace. So they needed the Jewish leadership to be in their pocket, to be happy, to get what they want, and to make sure that then those Jewish leaders would help keep the rest of the Jews in Jerusalem and in Judea in order. So that's why Felix had to do it and Festus had to do it. They're trying to manage the Roman Empire here and keep those guys in line. So they wished, he desired to, to do a favor, and so he's trying to give them the chance to say, well, Paul, do you want to be tried down in Jerusalem? And I love the way Paul responds. Verse 9, do you wish to go up to Jerusalem and there be tried on these charges before me? But Paul said, I'm standing before Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. He's saying, no, 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 no. If you hand me over to the Jews, I know what you're doing. You're basically saying, let's make this a Jewish matter. And he steps outside of the Roman uh, jurisdiction. He's being offered, and you would think, you're a Jewish guy. Don't you want to be kind of in your own people's hands? Because over here, like it's a mismatch. And Paul's saying, no, this is the right place to be. Because I have done nothing... He says to the Jews, no wrong. And he says, you yourself know it very well. I love the way that Paul uses all of his wits. And he puts it upon the leader to say, you've been hearing all this stuff publicly, and it's on record now he's saying, you know very well that this is true. Now he has to kind of put Festus in a corner. And he's saying, look, I haven't done any wrongdoing. I haven't done anything for which I deserve to die. He's saying, look, and if I had then I would be the last one to resist you. I, if I had done anything wrong, I don't escape to seek death. But if there's nothing in these charges against me, then no one can give me over. And here's where Paul lays it down. He's leaning into the Roman legal system, and he says, I appeal to Caesar. So as Paul makes his appeal to Caesar, now he's saying, I'm going to trust this system to play itself out. Now, as I go back over the details of this middle section of this preliminary hearing, we have to notice a couple things. We notice now Paul's participation. 
Paul isn't sitting back saying there's nothing to do here. He's using every power available to him to, to use his reasoning, to, to be smart before the, the people that are listening, and to, to reason out his case. And he's leaning into the system. So Paul's now participating. We ask the question, as I've been doing, well, who's, who's conducting the affairs? Well, you might say, in this case, Paul's got a little hand in trying to manage his, his legal situation, his affairs. Of course, he's still under the authority of others. But notice now, as we move from the preliminary hearing and the progression of those events, that something else happens. When he makes his appeal, this is the legal move, I appeal to Caesar, I want to go to the top of the justice system. Festus comes to the side, he's got a council of people there. Festus is the one sitting on the judgment seat. By the way, that word bema, it's the same judgment seat that's used of the judgment seat of Christ. And if you're thinking legal things right now and you're kind of interested, maybe your lawn order, like juices are flowing or something, don't miss the fact that there is another judgment seat on which Christ sits. The New Testament makes abundantly clear all will appear before that judgment seat where Jesus will sit down to hear the case. Your case, your life, your details. It's worth knowing. But in this case, he goes to his, his council, they confer together, and they go, there's not much of a case here, and he's made the appeal. And so he says, to Caesar you have appealed, to Caesar you shall rule. So now that's it. That's the preliminary hearing. He's basically saying there's not enough evidence right now to make a charge. We've got to move it along to the next step of the justice system. But that's not where this ends. It goes to the third section. In the third section, now we have somebody who comes to town. Notice this. It moves on, and we, and we find in verse uh, 13. Now, when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and greeted Festus. Okay. New people on the scene. Who's Agrippa? Who's Bernice? Agrippa is called King Agrippa. He's not the king, like Caesar ruling over all things. Underneath the Roman rule, he's basically what they call a client king. It's like, well, Caesar's in charge, but you can have client kingship over this area. And so he was the ruler over the area. He was one of the Herods. Herods. We've been trying to keep track of them. There's a bunch of them. Started with Herod the Great. But now this is um, Herod the Great's grandson. He's Herod Agrippa II. We've already had one Herod Agrippa who died in Acts chapter 12 when he decided to give a speech and give no glory to God. And God said, that's enough of that. This is the second one. And he comes with Bernice, not much known about her, except that's his sister, okay? So this, she's part of the royal family. This isn't his wife, this is his sister. Actually, he went to college with my sister. This is not in my notes whatsoever, but it's a good start. <laughs> church picture time. Anders Snyder and Katrina Snyder sat down for the church picture, and he says, oh, you're just a cute couple, why don't you just sit here? And he tried to sit my sister on my knee, like this sweet thing. I said, no, 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 we're talking sister Snyder, not... I'm pretty sure Greco would be appreciative that I'm making this clear right here. This is sister Bernice, not wife. All right, so we know who these folks are. They're in town. He's the one who uh, Festus must answer to, and so he's going to check in and see how things are going, and they spend some time in Caesarea doing the we're in charge thing, probably drinking and eating a lot, talking through the business of the day. And in the course of those days, Festus brings up Paul. He's going to talk about what, what, what Paul's case is, we don't exactly know why he would bring it up in conversation, but first of all, you got to know that, that Festus is getting ready to send this on to the next level of the justice system. So Festus is going to have to send a, a, a case uh, report to Caesar, a summary of what's going on. And I bet you he's curious to get a second opinion. How should I write this to Caesar? This is a strange case. So he starts talking about it. Now, he probably also wouldn't mind a second opinion on the matter because this is a criminal, a capital criminal offense. They're seeking the death penalty here. This is not a small peanuts case. This is a big deal. And he's probably talking about it because it's super unique and interesting. Look at the way that he lays it back out. Basically, this last section, he just reviews all the details that we've already heard. He says, so I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders there, they, they brought this case out to me and they were asking for a sentence of condemnation. That's where we get the death sentence 
is, is what they're seeking. He says, I answered him, it's not the custom of the Romans to give anyone um, before their accusers get to meet the accused face to face, saying, we're following the justice system here, so I, I couldn't just do what they wanted. So they laid this case against him, verse 17. So when I came here, I, I made no delay. On the next day, I, I got up onto my big chair, there's just steps, and brought the whole court scene around, around the, the judgment seat, and I, and I convened. And I was expecting, because this is a death sentence case, I was expecting to hear the gruesome details of what horrible evils this guy has done. And then, surprise of surprises, when they started talking about their case, it wasn't at all what I was expecting. It wasn't a gruesome murder. It wasn't some kind of terrible crime. It was them talking about Jewish law and, like, some guy named Jesus who... They said it was dead, but Paul was sitting here saying that Jesus God was alive. I mean, I'm telling you, this is not the case I expect. Can you imagine? Can you picture the conversation between Festus and Agrippa? Just scratching their heads, going, this is a strange one. And so, Agrippa, you happen to be here like, what do you think? <laughs> he lays it out. It's about their own religion, about a certain Jesus. And he says in verse 20, being at a loss how to investigate these things, I asked whether he wanted to go to Jerusalem. I figured, well, gosh, this sounds like kind of a religious Jewish thing. I thought he would prefer to just go into their system and let them make a decision, but he surprised me yet again. He appealed to be kept in custody and wanted the decision to be over, and that's where it stands, Agrippa. That's the latest on this case. And I love that the culminating point for this, for Festus, is I don't know how to investigate this one. I'm at a loss. I would know how to investigate a murder because then you start looking for witnesses and you look for, for alibis and you start trying to find who's got the, the, the murder implements and we just gather the evidence and figure out did he do it or didn't. But how do you investigate when the questions are around a resurrection and around these religious realities of who's following Jesus or not? And he's left at a loss. Now, I'm bringing this to a point. Just walk through these details, noticing a couple things. Now, I need you to notice this. The heart of this moment is in verses 18 through 20, where he's saying the whole thing seems to be about Jesus. The whole thing seems to hinge on who this person is and what his life was about, this death, and did he rise. That's where the crux of the matter seems to be. And that's important for us to notice, because all of this sort of legal beagle stuff what does it matter when the heart of the whole matter is, have you figured out who Jesus is? And I want to pause here and just present that question to each one of you here today. Have you figured out who Jesus is? Have you investigated? Are you at a loss on how to investigate these matters? Or are you able to help others who may be in that phase? You wouldn't be the first ones. There are some names you may know who had to grapple with the Realities that don't fit any of their investigatory processes. C.S. Lewis comes to mind. C.S. Lewis, professed atheist, living like an atheist, climbing the higher echelons of education in, the, in Great Britain. And yet he keeps hearing about this Jesus. C.S. Lewis had to come to grips with, is this real or is it not real? He became one of the great Christian apologists of our time. There's another guy named Josh McDowell you might have heard. He wrote a great volume called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And here he was among a bunch of students saying that Jesus stuff is bunk. And they were challenging him, saying, well, look into it then. And as he investigated the matter, turns out he was left in a corner going, it seems that this Jesus is who he says he is, and apparently he did what he said he was going to do. And one more that we mentioned, Lee Strobel. He wrote also about these matters. And Lee Strobel, I just want to have a quote from him because he was talking about his wife becoming a Christian. He was an atheist. He was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, I think, or Times. Crime investigatory reporter. This guy knows his stuff. He has a legal side and he has, a, and he has a, an investigatory reporting side. And when his wife goes nuts in his mind and decides to follow some crazy guy that says that he rose from the grave, he's going, we got to shut this down right now. And he decides to investigate the resurrection. And as he does, he spends two years of his life just wanting the evidence. 
Can a person rise from the grave? All kinds of questions. And he says at the end of this, and here I am quoting him, I remember writing out all these implications on my legal pad and leaning back in my chair. I had reached the culmination of nearly two year journey. It was finally time to deal with the most pressing question of all. Now what? After a personal investigation that spanned more than 600 days and countless hours, my own verdict in the case for Christ was clear. However, as I sat at my desk, I realized I needed more than an intellectual decision. You hear the echo from our passage, you want, I'm at a loss how to investigate these things. I can only get so far. And as soon as you get to the end of yourself intellectually, you will be left still with a mystery to decide, is Jesus the guy or is he not? And so, Strobel says, yes, I had to take a step of faith, as we do in every decision we make in life. He says, but here's the crucial distinction. I was no longer trying to swim upstream against the strong current of evidence. Instead, I was choosing to go in the same direction of the torrent of facts that they were flowing. That was the reasonable. That was the rational. That was the logical. And so he says, what's more, in an inner and inexplicable way, it was also what I sensed God's Spirit was nudging me to do. He saw the facts laid out before him. He couldn't deny them. And yet there was still an intangible aspect of the working of God to nudge and to push and to say, will you believe? And praise God, he says on November 8, 1981, I talked with God in a heartfelt, unedited prayer, admitting and turning from my wrongdoing and receiving the gift of forgiveness and eternal life through Jesus. I told him that with his help, I wanted to follow him and his ways from here on out. How many of you can say the same? He is the resurrected one. He is Lord, and if he is, then my life must align with that. Lee Strobel found it out. Others who have investigated have found it out. And I pray that if you're wondering, I challenge you to do the same investigating, and you'll get as far as you can, and there's a lot more there than you may believe. But when you come to the end of your intellectual self, you need to be ready to be encountered by God personally looking you in the eye and saying, will you have them? So we ask, as we think about what's going on here, we notice these details. It seems to be all about Jesus, and there's this question about how to investigate such a thing. We still need to ask, who's really conducting the affairs? Paul's very life on the line. In this case, now in the third scene, Paul's not even in the room. It's just two powers that be. And whatever their little side discussion with whatever their snack is, is they have this interesting conversation about an interesting guy named Paul. His life hangs in the balance. Festus is hoping for input from a higher official. Both are hoping to please even a higher one. They ask, who's conducting these affairs? And I believe that what we see unfold on the pages of Acts chapter 25 is we see levels of involvement. There is a personal level where Paul is able to have his hand in the mix. There is a societal level where the cogs of justice are moving and they are real, and yet somehow superseding and over all of it is the hand of God accomplishing what only God could do. And the conclusion that I just couldn't escape this week is that this is a passage about the sovereignty of God. Although you may say it just sounds like a bunch of kind of documenting of the steps of Paul's legal battle, where do you see God in this? And I say, how can I say that it's God? Let's recall, this story is a page out of a book, the book of Acts, that's outlining how God was planning to fulfill his promise and command that they would receive power, and when the Holy Spirit would come upon them, they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The outline was already there. The progress of the gospel towards the end of the earth was in motion. This is just one detailed moment in the midst of it. Acts chapter 9, when, when Paul is saved, Jesus made clear through Ananias that Paul was a chosen instrument of his to carry his name before Gentiles and kings and to the children of Israel. You want to tell me that it was only the Romans in charge or only the Jewish people in charge or only Paul trying to conduct his affairs? Paul knew he would be before Gentiles and kings. You think it was an accident that Agrippa showed up on the scene? No, because God knew kings would be there. Acts chapter 19, it was through the Spirit of God that Paul was resolved in the Spirit that he should proceed from Jerusalem and after that go to Rome. Acts chapter 23, don't forget that night in prison 
when all of this is beginning to unfold, now the idea has been out there, but now he's living it. And Jesus himself stands by him in prison and says, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Who's conducting these affairs? Is it Paul, the individual? Is it the powers that be? Is it God? Yes. All of it. All together. So, if this is a sermon about the sovereignty of God, and we must grapple with that reality, and that's where I want to leave us. I told you at the beginning that my, my hope was to, was to talk about this idea that when we consider the conducting of our affairs, what affairs of life are you worried about right now? What things are you waiting that seem pending? What, what government system needs to, as you're waiting for your driver's license in the mail, are you, are you hoping for something to play out in a, a school or a other institution? Your affairs, your daily affairs, this passage shows us the raw details of one individual life coming into a, a, a smash with the reality of God's movement in it all. So I turn to John Calvin. Some of you may go, okay, hold on. I would just say this about Calvin. I think for one thing, he's probably turning in his grave as we add an ism to the end of his name. It would have been the last thing he wanted. But I'll tell you that somebody, this man and others in in following, have thought deeply about these things. And if you want help thinking deeply about and grappling with the reality of the sovereignty of God, you might challenge yourself to something even more, like reading his institutes. But listen to what Calvin says. So it must be concluded that while the turbulent state of the world deprives us of, just, of judgment, God, by the pure light of his own righteousness and wisdom, regulates these very commotions in the most exact order and directs them to their proper end. Does that not sound like Acts chapter 25? Deprived of judgment, but here's God, his own righteousness, his own wisdom, regulating these very commotions in the exact order and directing them to their proper end. That is the sovereignty of God. And so, Calvin would say, whatever is attempted by men or by Satan himself, God still holds the helm in order to turn all their attempts to the execution of his judgments. My friends, all the attempts of man to turn this story this way or that, all the wrangling over Paul's life or what would happen with him, all the while God is at the helm. Fulfilling exactly what God had preordained to happen in his life. To be speaking of righteousness before Felix. To be telling to Festus the glories of the resurrection. To go before Agrippa, which is coming next, and unfold it all over again, day in and day out, with audiences he could have never captured for himself. Preaching the glory of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin. And the hope of the kingdom. Unbelievable! He could have never arranged that for himself. Now, if you're getting worried about well, how does this all work together, talk about God at the helm. I want to give you an illustration from A.W. Tozer because I believe that it's a helpful way, it's not a perfect way, to talk about how this, the realities of people involved conducting their affairs and yet God conducting their affairs, how it might work together. Tozer would say that his view is that God sovereignly decreed that man should be free to exercise moral choice. And man from the beginning has fulfilled that decree by making his choice between good and evil. Tozer would go on to say man's will is free because God is sovereign. A God less than sovereign could not bestow moral freedom upon his creatures. He would be afraid to do so. He's saying, you have your choice, my own way, underneath my own absolute freedom, I'll give you your own limited freedom, and I'll handle this. And so here's the illustration that Tozer gives. He says, perhaps a homely illustration might help to understand. An ocean liner leaves New York bound for Liverpool. Its destination is determined by proper authorities. Nothing can change it. This is at least a faint picture of sovereignty, he says. On board the liner are several scores of passengers. Not one is in chains. Neither are the activities determined for them by decree. 
They're completely free to move about as they will. They eat, sleep, play, lounge on the deck, read, talk, all together as they please. But all the while, the great liner is carrying them steadily onward to a predetermined orbit. Both freedom and sovereignty are present here, and they do not contradict each other, says Tozer. So it is, I believe, with man's freedom and the sovereignty of God. The mighty liner of God's sovereign design keeps its steady course over the sea of history. God moves undisturbed and unhindered toward the fulfillment of those eternal purposes which he purposed in Christ Jesus before the world began. We do not know it all, all that is included in those purposes, but enough has been disclosed to furnish us with a broad outline of things to come and to give us good hope and firm assurance of future well-being. I don't know if that picture is helpful to you. It is a little bit to me. But hear this. He says, we know enough. We know enough of the broad outline of what God's doing, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. We know that there is a time in coming where we will have to stand before God at the judgment seat and make an account of our lives. We know that there is good for those who are His, and in that there should be good hope and a firm assurance. And friends, that's where I want to bring this. I want to help you contemplate this reality that as we consider the, the, the conducting of our affairs, we do well. Let me tell you why I say it that way. We do well to remember that from him and through him and to him are all things. One, you do well to remember that this is all about Jesus. He is not entering your story. We have entered into his. And so, as we go about representing him in his story, we make Jesus the story. We speak of his life and his death and his resurrection. That's the consistent message of Paul as he works his way through Acts. And as we make Jesus the consistent center point, we can rest in his sovereign hand and moving him on. Even Calvin himself would say that our choices are involved here. He said, man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. That's Proverbs 16. This means that we're not at all hindered by God's eternal decrees, either from looking ahead for ourselves or from putting all our affairs in order. You see, he's saying, fine, go about your daily lives managing, conducting your affairs. You should make plans and work and be involved in the things of your life. You should know that there will be things that are out of your control. And when things are out of our hands, like somebody else making a decision for my life, then you really know that you're not in as much control as you want. But over, above, underneath, through it all, God is conducting these affairs. I was wondering, how am I going to make this a fresh sermon when we're just kind of going through the next phase? It's kind of the same stuff week in and week out. There's more coming about Paul's trial and all the details. But see, it's not. It's the same sermon. It's, it's the same storyline unfolding. The sovereign hand of God directing the course of human history toward his desired ends. I just couldn't escape that this week. It's still God telling Paul, you're going to be my witness before Gentiles and kings. And that's just how the details play out. Now we know the specifics of his life. And isn't it that the way it is with us? Hear me. The details, the affairs of your life are like this too. We're all just living in the details of how God's plans are playing out in the raw realities of individual and corporate lives. So John Murray would say of sovereignty, God's omnipotence is not a vain idol and as it were, a slumbering potency, but a vigilant, efficacious, and operative agency constantly exerted on every distinct and particular moment. The thing you're waiting for in the mail, the transaction you're hoping goes through, the, the person who has say over whether it's good or bad, all of those things, he's working in them. And I say, if this is a passage about God's sovereignty, and he's able to conduct the affairs of men and of history, of the cosmos and of rulers and followers and enemies, then what is it we think he can't do? Where is it that we think his capabilities stop and therefore our worries begin? Friend, I want to leave you thinking about the sovereignty of God, but I want to leave you with a profound contemplation on the magnificence of that sovereignty. Here's what Calvin would say, the necessary consequences of the knowledge of God governing all these things he says it should result in this, gratitude and prosperity, patience in adversity, and a wonderful security respecting the future. 
So is this a sermon about sovereignty? Yes, it is. And it could be a sermon about worry. It could be a sermon about purpose. It could be a sermon about hope. It could be a sermon about rest or about endurance or about boldness. Do you want a sermon about joy? Then let's think on the sovereignty of God because this is a sermon about all those things and more. Worry. Let's consider that in view of the, the sovereignty of God. If, if you need a sermon about worry, then cast your anxiety on him. He's for you. And his care is backed up by his capability. What a joy. That should decrease our worries. If you need a sermon about purpose and what to belong to and what your life's about, then stop trying to live your own life and write your own story and realize that your story can fold into the great story of God. That, my friend, will give you a sense of purpose and meaning, being a part of something greater than yourself. Do you need a sermon about hope? Then let it be settled. Your hope is secured in God, in Christ. We just sing it. Somebody say amen. Amen. Nothing can pluck us from his hands. You, my friend, have hope. I don't know what you think about what's going on in the world and all the affairs of men and rulers and leaders, but I, my friend, as I thought about this this week, I came out at the end of it going, I have hope. The sovereignty of God should be the end of hopelessness. Do you need a sermon about rest? Does the tumult and the chaos wear you out? Is it not trite or shallow to say God's got this? No, it is not trite or shallow to say God's got this. Let me tell you now, based on the reality of the Word of God, God's got this. So rest. O oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see? There's a light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So says the old song. But the Psalms also say, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Friend, when you lay your head on the pillow tonight, you can rest because God's got this. Do you need a sermon on endurance? Don't grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Why? Because God is at work, always at work. Do you need a sermon on boldness? Then follow Paul's reality, follow Paul's example, and stand boldly when you're given the chance and say, this is about Jesus. Do you need a sermon about joy? If you can't tell what's going on in your circumstances, then take a peek through the windows of Scripture. Say, I don't know how mine's going to turn out. And as we look in on Paul's and you see God's resume, then you can say, I'm going to look into the life of a fellow believer and another follower named Paul, and I'm going to take joy at the reality that God brings it through to great ends for his glory. Persecuted, bedraggled, outnumbered, overwhelmed, distraught church. You might say that's us, but I would say that was the church in Philippi. And Paul, from prison, says, rejoice in the Lord always. That's worth saying again. Rejoice. He said this to these believers because he said it has been granted that for the sake of Christ, they should not only believe but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that they saw he had and still had. Friends, There will be difficulties. There will be trials on this road. But it does not need to sap away our joy. Because our God reigns. I believe that as we just look at a trial, think about all the legal, legal terms, and we try to follow who's who, and who's making what decisions, and we ask the question, who's conducting these affairs here? Yes, Paul had a say in it, and he did his part. Yes, the leaders who were making decisions over his very life had a part, but in the end, at the base of it all, we find that God was in charge. And when we consider the conducting of our affairs, 
we do well to remember that from him and through him and to him are all things. I pray you will be doing well with all of these implications of God's sovereign hand. Listen, friends, if he's not God who's sovereign, then he's not God at all. If he's not a God who conduct all these affairs, then he cannot forgive sin. For sin is too powerful and runs too deep. But God rules over sin and death, and the resurrection proclaims it forever. Amen. For a sinner needing beauty, revived for a sinner needing hope, that's the best news you're going to hear all week. You need to investigate and come to Jesus? Do you need to take joy and rest and confidence or whatever else? I don't know what it is, but I pray that as you contemplate Paul's situation, you would see the hand of God. Unseen, but seen in all the circumstances. Let's pray. Jesus, I submit to you this contemplation. And I pray that you help your people swallowed up in your glory to the joy of self-forgetfulness to the to the greater confidence that we call faith and that from faith and through that faith you are glorified and we then can live and act in our circumstances the ones that will come to us today and tomorrow through our phones and at our desks and at our emails None of these day-to-day -day circumstances are outside of your control, and we celebrate that today with gratitude. Take these words and multiply them. No use, I pray in Jesus' name.